blanket. Some folks got together 10 years ago and dreamed up a little gathering that would happen here, nestled in the mountains of North Georgia. We outgrew a facility. We had to move around a facility. We landed here in this wonderful facility and thank the folks here at the Ridges for their hospitality. Well, I tell y'all what, Michael and I were talking, we've already had redbud winter, so right now we're in the middle of dogwood winter, so hold on to your hats, we only have locust, blackberry, and then britches winter to go. So don't put the long johns up yet. If you've got anything that makes a noise, anything like a cell phone, or if you're still old school with the beeper, or anything like that, please put it on silent. This is live right here, right now, and tonight we're doing something new and different. We have gone high tech. We have people in the back, a wonderful gentleman who is recording this, or oh, we're live, we're live, on YouTube. So everybody, wait to the people that are watching at home, yay! All the folks at home and the ships at sea. Our OLEO tonight is being sponsored by the John C. Campbell Folk School. Yay! Yay! Oh, you all are a lively bunch tonight. You are so nice. So, so nice. Um, we got some more stuff going on, but before I forget it, this lovely lady here, her name is Courtney. And Courtney has provided our sign language all day long. <laughs> Her. Sometimes I'm, I'm listening to the teller and I'm, I'm busy watching her, so she is so so good at that. Have you been here all day? Have you not had the most lot of fun? Yeah. Well, the great thing is, it ain't over yet. Because tonight, we're going to start off with a bang. Megan Hicks, if you ask her what her favorite story is, she'll say whichever story I am telling right this minute. And right now, we're going to find out which one that is. Come on up, Megan. Royal balls. 
You want to go? There's a voice behind her. It's not too late. I can get you there in under 15 minutes. Cinderella turned around to see who was talking. There wasn't anybody standing there, just a fat groundhog on its haunches, eating slugs from the beer trap that she had set out. <laughs> the groundhog held up a slug. She said, you know, I really like this beer marinade thing you got going. Great texture, good flavor, low sodium. She popped one in her mouth, swallowed it, stifled a belch. Cinderella stared, dumbstruck. The groundhog said, so are you going to the ball or aren't you? Why would I want to, said Cinderella. Well, because you would be beautiful and enigmatic. The women would envy you. The men would want to hold you in their arms. And who knows, the prince might even fall in love with you. I get it, she said. You mean like in a Nora Ephron movie. <laughs> Except that A, I am not beautiful. B, I'm about as enigmatic as a cold shower. You know, C, I don't even own a dress. D, I don't have the requisite fairy godmother to put the package all together. And E, I just found out that the prince got his second DUI. <laughs> Does that sound like anybody you'd want to date? I certainly don't want to. But, 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 but they assured me. They assured me that this was exactly the sort of thing female humans dream of. Yeah, said Cinderella, well, I never bought the dream. Or maybe I just know I, I don't have what it takes to put the dream together, you know, the looks, the clothes, the charm, the fairy godmother. Maybe, maybe I've just got a bad case of sour grapes. Well, said the groundhog, I concede, you are somewhat plain. Your personality is, shall we say, blunt. Your taste in clothes is um, subdued. And you know, while you don't have a regulation fairy godmother, you do have me. Here she flicked the wand and said, fairy dust flying, and Cinderella said, and you are your fairy groundhog, for heaven's sake. Isn't that patently obvious? Right, 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 my fairy groundhog. Why do I have a fairy groundhog? The little creature's shoulders slumped. She said, you're disappointed, I can tell. They warned me, they said no human with any intelligence would give me any credence at all. So it looks like now I'll never get to be a fairy godmother. I'll never get to find out if this silly wand does anything besides spit glitter. <laughs> Is this they you keep referring to? Oh, it's, it's the faculty. The faculty, my, my teacher's at Gaga. Gaga. Gaga, Grimm's Academic, Accredited Godmother Academy. <laughs> I'm in my final year. You were supposed to be my capstone project. <laughs> See, the assignment is I'm to find a disconsolate ingenue, a martyr, if possible. <laughs> I'm to give her a whole hair, face, wardrobe, makeover, send her off to a social function, fix it so she finds true love. Oh, I'm not helping, am I? No. You are not. All right, I'll go to the ball. But promise me no ringlets, and I will not wear foundation garments. Uh, <laughs> why, why don't you make me something simple in black? Well, the fairy groundhog got right to work, and in no time at all, there stood Cinderella, coiffed, manicured, dressed in a stylish, long-sleeved black silk t-shirt and a long black skirt. She caught a reflection in the patio door. She said, ooh, ooh, I like this. I really like this. Well, we're not done, said the groundhog. We got to accessorize. It's 20% of my grade. <laughs> Ping, gold hoops decorated Cinderella's ears. Zing, a diamond pendant hung at her throat. Ding, Gucci bag hung off her shoulders. Bibbidi bobbidi boo, Cinderella found herself teetering in four inch glass high heels. She said, lose the shoes now. I can't do it, said the groundhog. Footwear is mandatory. It's the test for permanent transmogrification. <laughs> well, but, but, but I gotta be able to walk if you want me to get to that ball. So, in a half hearted attempt at passive aggression, the very groundhog turned the four-inch glass high heels into 
Converse All-Stars, 16-hole lace-up glass tennis shoes. Better, she said. Cinderella looked down, she said, these are awesome. Oh, well, <clears throat> all right. So to get you to the ball, would you prefer um, um, a coach or a limo? What's wrong with a cab? said Cinderella. So, boom, there idling in the driveway was a green and black classic checker cab. <laughs> oh, this is so good, said Cinderella. The groundhog was about to tell her to be home by midnight when Cinderella rendered her speechless by scooping her up and stowing her into the shoulder bag. What are you doing, said the groundhog. I am ensuring that I have somebody to speak to once I get to this social function. Well, as it turned out, Cinderella had a ball. By the time she arrived, the prince had already passed down under a table, so that was one possibility she didn't even have to think about. Her two ditzy stepsisters caught sight of her across the crowded ballroom, but before they could make their way over with their oh, squeals and ear kisses, the caterer mistook her for one of his own black uniformed crew and asked if she would mind going back into the kitchen for another tray of escargot. And in this way, Cinderella found herself happily engaged all evening with the courteous, well-spoken caterer whose sparkling eyes and balding patterns she found irresistible. <laughs> the groundhog feasted on escargot until she had eaten herself into oblivion, and there she snored within the supple folds of the Gucci bag until the gonging of the midnight clock. <gasps> midnight! Oh, Cinderella! She scrambled to the top of the bag. Cinderella, we must go! The magic wears off at midnight! Quickly, quickly! But Cinderella at this point heard nothing but the flutter of her own smitten heart. She and the caterer were locked in fond embrace right beside the walk-in freezer, sharing love's first kiss. It was a long kiss, too. It lasted all 12 gongs of the clock. <laughs> and in the ensuing silence, a soft bing, zing, bing, signaled Cinderella's return to normalcy. There she was, frizzy hair, grubby fingernails, flannel work shirt, the caterer stepped back, did a double take, and said, that is a cool trick, and resumed the kiss. <laughs> now here's how the evening turned out. The fairy groundhog did, in fact, graduate from Gaga. With full honor, she passed her capstone project with distinction, but she never went on to get certified as an LCFG, Licensed Certified Fairy Godmother, because she had seen a bunch of Disney films in a senior symposium that depicted all the American fairy godmothers as showing up for work in bad prom dresses. <laughs> and she said, no, 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 life is too short to endure taffeta. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so she opened a stylish little lunchroom in Gobbler's Knob, Pennsylvania. It's called Mollusks and More. <laughs> Cinderella supplies her with marinated slugs. Her caterer friend is very generous with cooking tips and recipes. Cinderella is very happy. She let the groundhog talk her into that social function because as a result of that one excursion, she is now full partner in a thriving restaurant with the fairy groundhog. She is dating a prince of a sweetheart. And that girl owns a pair of Converse All-Stars. Her sisters would kill for her. Yeah. <laughs> Along with the John C. Campbell Folk School, who is sponsoring our OLEO tonight, Megan has been sponsored also by the Nora Roberts Foundation and to the Lawrence family. Tonight, right after the OLEO, if you want to go right back through the hallway back there to the Blue Ridge room, we're going to have ghost stories. Come if you dare. 
Nestor Gomez, who is sponsored by the Tom and Angela Wilkerson, was born in Guatemala and made his way to Chicago in the mid-80s. He's a 79 times Moth Slam winner. I don't even think I could say Moth Times Slam winner 79 times. You see, I couldn't say it twice. You can read his complete bio like you can for all of these wonderful tellers in the program. So without further ado, Nestor. I have been living in Chicago for about 20 something years. And my mother has lived in Chicago even a little bit longer. But every Sunday, we had a tradition. Every Sunday morning, I go to my mom's house to have Guatemalan breakfast with my Guatemalan mother to keep our Guatemalan traditions alive. I have two jobs. Job number one, eat my mother's food. I have no problem with that. <laughs> job number two, stop by the Guatemalan bakery to get some Guatemalan bread for a Guatemalan breakfast. So this Sunday, I go to the, to the Guatemalan bakery like I do every Sunday, and I cannot believe my eyes. Is that true? I asked the lady at the counter. Oh yeah, she said, we saw pollo campero here. Okay, now I can see by your lack of reaction that you don't know what pollo campero is. So let me explain it to you. Pollo campero means country chicken. Okay, I can see you still like, okay, dude, country chicken, what's country chicken? Pollo campero, country chicken is the most delicious chicken that you can have in your life. It's a chicken that is made at a restaurant called Pollo Campero, of course, which is the most famous fast food restaurant in Guatemala. But the chicken is delicious. It's made with a secret recipe and secret spices. And in Guatemala, we often went to this restaurant to celebrate things, and we went there with the whole family when we had money. But we've been in Chicago for 20 something years and we haven't had any chicken, any pollo campero. So I look at that and immediately like, forget about the bread. I'm gonna get pollo campero instead. So I asked, how much for two pieces? And the lady's like, $50. Yeah, I'm cheap. I don't like spending money. And $50 back then, I was making like $5 an hour. So when you make five dollars an hour, you don't think fifty dollars. You think it's 10, 10 hours of work, minus taxes for two days, minus the things that I have to pay. It's gonna be like three weeks. Uh uh, it's not happening. I'm cheap. I don't want to spend fifty dollars in two pieces of chicken. So instead, I tell the lady, um, how about how much for one piece? I said like twenty five. So I'm like, okay, maybe I could have one piece for me, and don't tell my mom about it. So I order one piece of chicken, and the lady says, okay, you'll be ready in three weeks. Come back in three weeks. I'm like, three weeks for a piece of chicken? What? And she's like, he's like, sir, this is a bakery. We don't make any chicken here. There are no pollo camperos in Chicago. My husband goes to New York, buy the chicken there, and then brings it back. He can't go every day, so at the end of the month, he goes and brings the chicken for everybody that orders, so you have to wait three weeks. And then he hits me. In three weeks, is my mother's birthday. And you're thinking, you're gonna buy a piece of chicken for your mom's birthday? Yes, I am. Because this is pollo campero, the most delicious chicken you could have in your whole life. So I order a chicken and I go home, I go to my mom and I don't say anything about the chicken. Three weeks later they call me and I am so happy. I go to the bakery, I come here for my chicken, two pieces of chicken, and the lady looks at me like, I need you chicken. She gives me the chicken and it's frozen. That's what I say. <laughs> and I start complaining and that is like, sir, I don't know you coming right back as I call you to come pick up your chicken. Some people take a week, some people take two weeks. So when my husband goes to New York to buy the chicken, he put the chicken in a freezer, we freeze it, so to, just to keep it good for the people because we don't know how long it's gonna take. But don't worry, just put it on the microwave, it's gonna be ready after two minutes. $50 for two pieces of processed chicken, this better be good when I get to my mom's house. I get to my mom's house and I knock on the door. And my niece opens the door. What you want? I'm not here to see you. I'm here to see my mom, I told her. Whatever she says, she closes the door, she goes into her room, closes the door of her room. I ignore her. 
I go into the kitchen and I tell my mom, close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes, sit down, close your eyes. My mom closes his eyes, sits down, I put the chicken in the microwave, two minutes, ping, I open the door of the, of the microwave. Is that pollo campero? My mom says, is that food? Says my niece. As she opens the door of her room, goes into the kitchen, grab my piece of chicken and put ketchup on it. Thank you. <laughs> and she put ketchup on it. So I go, no! What? You don't put ketchup on pollo campero. Why not? Because it's the most delicious chicken. It's made with a secret recipe, a secret spices. Like AFC. <laughs> and I kind of want to tell her, yes, but no, because this is pollo campero, the most delicious chicken you can have in your life. I look at her and I look at my mom and I try to explain to her and I look at my mom and my mom is eating her chicken. <laughs> She's happy and I look, my mom is eating her chicken, my niece is eating her chicken. Where's my chicken? I pay $50 for this chicken and I'm not having any. So I look at my mom and say, can you give me one little tiny piece of chicken? And she takes a little piece of chicken and she puts it in my hand. And I pay $50 for this little nugget of chicken. I'm cheap, I don't like to spend money. I grab a piece of chicken, $50 for this little piece of chicken and I put it in my mouth and immediately all the memories of going to the Pollo Campero with my family in Guatemala coming to my head and I can see my shoulder and I feel so happy and the chicken is so delicious and I see my mom and she's eating her chicken with tears of happiness running down her face. And so I realized, yeah, $50 is a lot of money, but memories are priceless. Thank you. back here at the back, uh, CDs, thumb drives, what those other little whatever floppy disks, cassette tapes, books for old school people like me. Uh, there's also festival t-shirts from years past and also this one. Oh, let's see what else. Oh, the quilt raffle. If anybody wants to take this quilt home, and I don't know of anybody in this room that actually wants it, <laughs> other than Lona. Amen. <laughs> you can get raffle tickets, and uh, it will be uh, drawn yesterday, tomorrow, and you don't have to present to win. They'll mail it to you if you're not here. Our next teller, Lynn Cabral, is sponsored by the Nora Roberts Foundation, the Lawrence family. He's an internationally acclaimed storyteller and has been doing so. He's been thrilling and entertaining audiences internationally since 1976. So hold on to your hats, grab hold to your chair, and let's welcome Lynn. <laughs> Every now and then we'd go out for lunch together. 
And one day we went out for lunch. It was in August. It was a hot August day. I was driving. We had lunch. We were driving back to where I lived and where he worked. And as I was driving up the street, riding down the street on a bicycle that was way, way too small for him, was this guy who was huge. <laughs> he was huge. He didn't have a shirt on. All he had on was muscles. <laughs> he had muscles on top of muscles. He had muscles where most of us don't even have places. <laughs> he was huge. He was so big, he made King Kong apologize. That's how big he was. He's riding down the street. I said to my brother, Ali, Look at the size of this guy. <laughs> and as he rode by us, he blocked out the sun. <laughs> we were in the shade. I said, wow. <laughs> I continued driving until we came to a parking lot. It was a community parking lot. I pulled into that parking lot and I looked. And right there in the middle of the parking lot was a car. And its four doors were open. And there were people sitting in the car. And the people in the car, they just had their lunch. And I could tell they just had their lunch because everything they didn't eat was on the ground outside the car. There were potato chip bags, soda cans, McDonald boxes, Dunkin' Donut boxes, banana peels, all this trash. I said, no way, no way. They're going to clean this mess up. I live here. They don't live here. They're going to clean this mess up. So I parked the car. My brother and I, we get out of the car. We start walking across the parking lot, feeling like a couple of gladiators, you know. <laughs> when all of a sudden I stop, because I noticed from the corner of my eye, I noticed that fellow with all the muscles. He rides that bike into the parking lot, gets off the bike, gives it to a little boy whose bike it was. And that fellow with all the muscles walks across the parking lot over to that car and he sits down in the driver's seat. It's his car. Those are his friends. It's their trash. Right away I stopped. I had to reevaluate the situation. <laughs> I said to my brother, I said, hey, Ali, you know, uh, <laughs> it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> and it did, didn't look that bad. I said, I, I can always clean it up myself, no problem. Come on, let's go. And I thought my brother had agreed with me. As we walked across the street, we stood on the curb on the other side of the street. We stood there, we watched, and we listened. As all the doors of that car closed at once, boom, and that fellow with all the muscles, he puts one hand on the steering wheel, drops his other arm out the window of the car. His arm is so long, <laughs> it touches the ground. <laughs> he kickstarts the car with a little nudge. <laughs> His knuckles are dragging on the ground. <laughs> Sparks coming from his <laughs> He pulls out of the parking lot, out into the street. He starts to drive by us. I'm standing there like this. <laughs> when all of a sudden I hear my brother's voice. My brother says, excuse me, excuse me. My heart goes, Beep! excuse me. The fellow driving the car looks at us, reaches back, pinches the rear tire of the car. <laughs> <laughs> My brother says, excuse me, can we have all that stuff over there? You know, the banana peels, the soda cans, McDonald boxes, Dunkin' Donut boxes. Can we have all that stuff? The guy looks at us, looks at all that trash, looks back at us, 
reaches over and he grabs the shift. I'm praying that he's going to put it in reverse <laughs> and not park. He puts it in reverse. He releases the rear tire of the car. The car rolls back down the street. He turns it into that parking lot, right into the center of all that trash. He pinches the rear tire. <laughs> he gets out of the car. He orders his friends out of the car. He points and they pick. He points and they pick. He points and they pick. They're as afraid of him as I am. They pick up all their trash, plus trash that's been there for six weeks. <laughs> they put it in a big dumpster. They get back into the car. The doors all close. Boom. He puts one hand on the steering wheel, drops his other arm out the window of the car. His arm is so long, it touches the ground. He kickstarts the car once again with a little nudge. His knuckles are dragging on the ground, sparks coming from his jewelry. He pulls out of the parking lot, out into the street. He starts to drive by us. I'm standing there like this. He looks at us and he goes, <laughs> and he drives on the street. I go, my brother nudges me and says, Len, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. <laughs> Tact. <laughs> one from Delaware. It's, that's how this thing goes. Michael Reno Harrell is sponsored by South Arts and Greg and Gail Boots. He's an award-winning veteran songwriter and storyteller whose voice is as smooth as your granny's gravy and as warm as that gravy over biscuits on a cold winter morning. Welcome Michael Reno Harrell. <laughs> Everybody had fun today. Woo! I'm telling you. For those of you, I guess all of you were here today. I assume most of you. I talked a little bit about my dad's dad from Mitchell County and how a, a man recruited him to move to Spartanburg, South Carolina, and go to work with cotton mills down there. My dad grew up, like I say, in the Depression, in a cotton mill village down there. Uh, but the place he came from, up in Mitchell County, if you've ever been up there, that's right, at, that's right up in the steepest part of the mountains up there, up where Mount Mitchell is, it's over 6,000 feet. It's, uh, it's a lot, well, there's a whole lot of that going on, you know what I mean, it's real lumpy up there, there's all kind of, now, we never saw my grandfather except once a year because it was a long way from Morristown, Tennessee to Spartanburg, South Carolina back then. Uh, you drove about three and a half hours to get to Asheville and then you had to go all the way over to, to the edge of the Blue Ridge and off the Blue Ridge and there was a road that went like this. I asked my mother one time, I said, I don't see how they built this road. And Mama said, I think what they did was they pinched a snake's tail and followed it with a bulldozer. <laughs> it was, and I'd get car sick, oh, it was awful. But we'd go down there and see my granddaddy on the 4th of July, the week that the cotton mills got for vacation, one week a year. And I remember one year, went down there, and uh, my dad said, Let's go back up to the mountains and look at the old home place. So my grandfather, for the first time in low, I don't know how many years, decided he'd go back to the mountains. He'd been living in the Piedmont all that time. So we went back up there and they took me to the little farm that he rented back in the, in the uh, early part of the century. 
and it was a little creek valley, just a little, we'd call it a branch that came down a little, it was a valley about that steep. <laughs> and I remember walking up there and looking at that, and I said, Granddaddy, what did you grow here? He said, well, I grow corn. And I said, but it's so steep up here. How would you even plant it? He said, well, boy, there wasn't nothing to it. You just load your shotgun with corn, walk out on the front porch, got her done like that. I said, but how did you hoe it? She said, just lean on your elbow and work, you know, it wasn't hard. But anyway, we'd go down there and sit. Now, he worked in a cotton mill, I think about 36 years. And he smoked four packs of cool regular cigarettes a day. So he talked like this most of the time. And he, I remember when I was just a little bitty kid, maybe five or something, him sitting on the front porch of that mill house that he lived in. And the front porch was maybe four feet. You could sit in a chair and lean back against the wall and put your feet on that rail. It was just a little bitty porch. And he had, he had leaned a straight back chair against that wall so long that there were two grooves, one in the side of his house, where the back of that chair, and I asked him one time, I said, Granddaddy, I said, look what you're doing to your house. And he turned around and looked, he said, oh, he said, that's, that's a safety factor right there. He said, that keep you from turning over Saturday night if you get drunk. <laughs> it seemed to work for him, I never saw him turn over. Uh, but I remember one time my dad sitting on the, on the porch field, and his dad, after supper, we'd gone out to, he called it watch the street lights come on. So just, he just liked to go out and see if we could get a little air out there in Spartanburg in the summer. So uh, I remember as a little kid thinking, Spartanburg, South Carolina is the hottest place in the world. But that's where I'd ever been to Columbia. <laughs> Y'all been to Columbia, ain't you? Anyway, I remember him sitting there and it came out after dinner to have that first smoke, you know, and my dad sitting there and he reached in his shirt pocket and got those cool regulars, had a little cork tip keep you from sticking to your lip. He did it on his lighter. sitting down there watching him, he said, <laughs> Boy, <laughs> you see your daddy sitting here on this rail?
went in the house and we stayed up playing music till four or five o'clock in the morning. And uh, Carmen got up and fixed me my first dose of huevos rancheros, and I thought, this is the best fun I've had in a long time. So we got in Steve's truck, and he said, let me show you some of this country out here. So we were riding down Highway 58, I think it was, going south through those hills down through there, no trees, you know, not just sort of bare and a little plant here and there. He said, I'm gonna show you something you've probably never seen. I said, well, good. So we were riding along, we come around the corner and there was a billboard on the side of a mountain that's just about the size of that back wall and it said, Gold Rush Land Development Company proudly presents for sale the entire city of Madrid, New Mexico. <laughs> and we came around the corner and there it was, little valley like this. And on this side over here, there was a big tower coming out of the ground with a big wheel on the top of it. Well, I knew what that was, that's a mine shaft. That's what took the miners up and down, brought the ore up and down and all that stuff. And a bunch of old machinery laying around there, just junk machinery. But on this side over here was where the workers lived. And it was a whole row of little shacks that were one room wide and three rooms deep, one right after another. Then there was another row of them right here. And then there was about four bigger houses behind that and then a big house behind that. And they were all abandoned. Of course, hippies live in them now. Well, I guess probably people from California that were doctors live in them now, I don't know. <laughs> but there was nobody living there at that time. He said, I bet you ain't never seen nothing like this. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, that mine shaft there, if that was a brick chimney about 120 feet tall, I'd say we were riding past the cotton mill village. I said, I can take you to South Carolina and show you 20 places that look like this. Rusty hinges on the doors, dusty papers on the floors, scattered dreams and nothing more in my town. We made our homes there on that hill and we gave our life's blood to the mill, but now it's quiet and still in my town. Woke up to the whistle scream Back when cotton still was keen When it was us and our machines In my town Smokestack with the company name Used to welcome everyone who came And now it's never gonna be the same in my town It's muddy streets and shotgun shacks Where memories run through the cracks Time has finally broke the back of my town Any day the cuts who vines are gonna eat it all right up to the power lines. A lot of me got left behind. In my town. Once there were 500 souls, now there's no one left here growing old. Just raccoons and crows in my town. Oh, I can tell you why I died. Economics cut and dry. They let the bottom line aside in my town. We thought it would never leave And now somewhere 
in China they believe they're gonna always spin and weave like we did in my town the thread has finally come unwound the wind is now the only sound just me and these ghosts workshops in the Blue Ridge room right through there. All our tellers will be back up here on the stage for their solo sets and then the birthday party and then the final oleo tomorrow night before we have to say goodbye for another year. But we don't have to say goodbye yet. We still have Ann Rutherford on the program tonight. Sponsored by Canute and Kathy Rary. Ann comes all the way from the Pacific Northwest to North Georgia to tell us what she thinks tonight. <laughs> so wonderful to be with you. We have had some powerful memories tonight, powerful memories. They call us back and they move us forward. And sometimes the thing you remember is the first time that you did something. Now, it's my first time here, so I'm going to remember this for a long time to come with great joy. And sometimes it's uh, the first time you do something like your first kiss, maybe in front of a walk-in freezer. <laughs> <laughs> or your first car, maybe your first kiss and your first car are related. <laughs> or the first time you catch a fish. I remember the first time I caught a fish. And it was all thanks to my grandma. I was eight years old visiting my grandparents in Denver, Colorado. My uncles were going fishing. I really wanted to go, but they wouldn't take me. Oh, no, my uncle said. Little thing like you, we take you up there, you hook one of them Rocky Mountain trouts. Those fish are so strong, they will yank you off your feet, pull you into that current. We will never see you again. I was skeptical. I didn't know the word at the time, but that's what I was, skeptical. Because <laughs> this was the same uncle the year before who had terrified me at our family camp out with tales of the camp robber bird. Oh, the camp robber bird, my uncle said. Oh, it's big as an eagle. It's gray as a thundercloud. Orange eyes, yellow claws, swoops down from the trees, seizes little children from outside the tent, carries them off, never to be seen again. Beware. <laughs> the camp robber bird. <laughs> The next morning, it took 20 minutes for my mother to convince me for, to come out of our tent because I was so afraid of ka -ka, ka -ka, ka! the camp. And I knew 
my uncle was not being truthful with me about the reason he didn't want to take me fishing. They didn't want to take me fishing, not because I was too little, it was because I was a girl. And my grandma knew it too. Huh, she said. Well, if you fellas won't take her, I'll take her myself. Ha, my uncle said. What's that mean, said grandma. Never seen you catch a fish. You've seen me clean plenty of them. Cleaning isn't catching. Then he saw the look my grandma gave him, and he was smart enough to say no more. <laughs> get me a pole, my grandma said to my uncle. Annie, get your coat, meet me at the car. We're gonna go up to the mountains. You're gonna catch yourself a fish. Your uncle's gonna clean it for you. <laughs> so next thing I know, I'm beside grandma and her VW bug, and we are driving up to the Rocky Mountains, speeding up to the Rocky Mountains, and I do mean speeding. My grandma learned to drive when she was 60 years old. It imprinted her on her that the speed limit was whatever age you were at the time. <laughs> at this time of the story, she was 78. We made it to the fishing hole in no time. Grandma, should I dig for some worms? No, no, she said. She unsnapped the black purse that always hung from her elbow. She pulled out a little can of Vienna sausages. <laughs> Cocktail wieners? We'll use these for bait, my grandma said. I don't know anything that won't eat one of these. <laughs> Once. She popped the top, she helped me get the meter on the hook, and my line was in the water. I was fishing. Grandma, never one to waste a moment, opened her purse again, pulled out her tatting. My grandma tatted using those, uh, that lustrous thread, like macrame thread, and those sharp, they look like crochet needles, little tiny steel crochet needles. Grandma tatted as fast as she drove, so you could just see the doily appear as she sat there on the riverbank, tatting, I'm fishing, the line's in the water, Grandma's speed tatting beside me, the sky is a clear Colorado blue, life is good, and then I felt the hair rise on the back of my neck, like you do when you're getting watched. I looked over my shoulder, Grandma! There's a mountain goat. There was a little mountain goat right on the edge of the trail that led further up. It was just watching us intently. It has its ears poked in front of its little horns, watching. Grandma, wow, whoa, Grandma, I think I got something. Okay, don't panic, Grandma said, but before she could get to her feet, whatever I had hooked yanked me off of mine, and I was flying toward the water, and then I felt a tug on my ankles just as I was about to go face first into the current. It was Grandma to the rescue. So grandma's not going to let go of her granddaughter. I'm not letting go of the pole. The fish wants off the hook. We had a tug of Anne situation going on. That's why as I, I'm as tall as I am today. I gained a couple inches in that epic struggle and the grandma gives a big yank and she and I fall back on the bank and the fish flips up. The hook falls free from its mouth and we watch it go tail over gill, a silvery circle against the blue Colorado sky, and we watch it as it goes over our heads and lodges, tail first, between the horns of the mountain goat. <laughs> and we all had a moment, me, grandma, the goat, the fish, and then, that's our fish, grandma said. Goat turns around, takes off up the mountain, and grandma and I are right behind it, and you're thinking, what chance does a 78-year-old woman and an 8-year-old girl have of outrunning a mountain goat? But you may have heard of these kind of mountain goats, probably from somebody within this room. This is a special kind of goat. They've gone around and around those hills, you know, the kind that you shoot corn up to plant it. They've gone around and around those hills. So many generations, they've evolved to have one leg shorter than the other to keep their belly. You know these goats. When grandma scared the goat, it got confused, so it was going in the wrong direction, so it had its long leg against the mountain and its short leg on the outside, plus it had the fish between its horns. I mean, the poor thing, really, it was kind of hobbling along. We were gaining on it, and the goat stopped short, and we banged into it. Fish flew out of the goat's horns into what had caused the goat to stop in the first place. Yeah, thank you! Grizzly bear, exactly! Picking berries! Fish slams into the bear's chest. The bear catches it, thinks, sushi. <laughs> and we all have a moment. Me, grandma, the goat, the bear, the fish. And then grandma says, that's our fish. The bear turns around, 
takes off back on the trail, and Grandma and I are right behind it. But that bear is making tracks. It's got the fish up against it. It's like a football up against it, and it's parting the bushes with its paw, just leaping over. It's like a linebacker just going down the field. Grandma, we're going to lose it, Grandma. I can see that the trees are clearing out ahead. Grandma does not miss a beat. She just cocks her elbow, lobs her purse at that fleeing Bruin. <laughs> Purse nails the bear on the back of the head. The bear sinks like a stone on the edge of the clearing. Fish flies out of the bear paws. It goes up, 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 up. A silvery circle tail over gill against the blue Colorado sky. <laughs> out of the trees it swooped. Big as an eagle, gray as a thundercloud, orange eyes, yellow claws. <gasps> Camp Robert Bird, Grandma! It was a good thing I wasn't the first thing to set foot in that clearing. <laughs> Camp Robert swoops down, seizes the fish, starts to fly <coughs> off with it. That's our fish, Grandma says. She reaches down where her purse has spilled open beside the comatose bear, grabs her tatting, throws it up in the air. The tatting goes up like a lace doily with those steel needles flashing in the sun. Camp Robber flies right into it like a bird into a net and it struggled to get free and loses control of the fish and the fish fell down, 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 <gasps> right into my waiting arms. <laughs> and folks, thanks to my grandma, that's how I caught my first fish. <laughs> place winner of the Northwest Folk Flyers Contest. <laughs> One more round of applause for our wonderful fellows. in the back, the oleos and the workshops, everything starting again in the morning. Y'all be safe tonight. Sleep tight. Don't let the big buttons bite. See you in the morning.